I'm Ben Witherington III. I am Amos Professor of New Testament for the Greek New Testament with doctoral studies at Asbury Theological Seminary. Dr. Ben Witherington, Ben, great. Thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. My pleasure. Good to be with you. And, and hello to all my friends at Wheaton. Oh, listen, it's a great place. I miss it every week, you know. Maybe not every day, but most of, most of the weeks I do. Hey, listen, how did you get started reading Greek? Tell us about that. Well, that's an interesting question. I had some classics going through public school in High Point. I did Latin. Greek was not available. So I had three years of Latin before I went off to Carolina. And ever so glad I did, too, because that, that got me going on a language approach to, to life in general. And then when I got to Carolina, I started taking New and Old Testament courses. Uh, religion turned out to be my minor. English literature was my major. But lo and behold, there was this new professor at Carolina in 1970 named George Kennedy. And George Kennedy taught me Greek. And it was not just any Greek. It was both classical or Hellenistic Greek and the New Testament Greek. So if you can picture this, we were reading Xenophon's Anabasis and the Book of Acts at the same time. <laughs> and it was fantastic. It, and, and George, at that point, was Mr. Animated. I remember a day when he came into class and he stood up on top of his desk and pronounced the uh, speech of Paul at the Areopagus in Acts 17 in Greek. And I went, holy smokes. So that's what it sounded like. <laughs> you know, I got fired up. And, and I had a wonderful Bible teacher, Bernard Boyd, who was encouraging me to study Greek and study Hebrew and, and all of that stuff. So I wanted to go to a seminary where that was really viable and possible and where they would require it before you try to do exegesis, you know, and uh, and so that's what I did. I went to Gordon-Conwell from there and then the University of Durham in England. And you've been using that throughout your career as as a, a scholar of the New Testament. It's, it's kind of hard to imagine being able to really analyze and do proper exegesis without engaging the primary original text. Well, exactly. I like to say a text without a context is just a pretext for whatever you want it to mean. And every translation is already an interpretation. Right. So really, you're going to do a lot better dealing with the original languages because you are more likely to get it right if you're dealing with the original languages. Well, today we're going to talk about a passage from the Christmas story, it's Luke chapter 2, verse 7. And, and you said earlier that almost on a regular basis, when this thing is translated in modern translations, they sort of miss it. Give us a little bit of background to that. What are we looking at? As you know, in 1611, when King James's first whole English translation came out, based actually not on an original translation, based on Tyndale and the Coverdale Bible and various other English translations that already happened, what happened in that passage really determined what happened in subsequent English translations because the influence of the KJV was so strong and still is in various quarters in the South in the United States today, that people didn't dare vary from it. Hmm. My professor at Princeton, Bruce Metzger, said that when the RSV came out, he was the head of the committee of the RSV, and the RSV did not translate Isaiah 714, and a virgin shall conceive, but rather translated it on the basis of the Hebrew, and a young woman of marriageable age will conceive. Baptists all over the South were burning the RSV translation. <laughs> you can see already, even into the 50s and 60s, how impactful the KJV translation was. So it's not a surprise that until we get to the NIV in the 70s and, and subsequent versions of the NIV and a few other translations, that this passage actually says what the Greek says. The Greek does not say, well, they ended up in a barn. First of all, there were no barns in the first century AD. <laughs> Room in the inn. 
Mm. There were no Holiday Inns in Bethlehem. It was a one-stop light town like Wilmore, Kentucky, right? And furthermore, that word Cataluma doesn't mean in. Luke had a perfectly good word for that. That's pandion, and you see that in the in the parable of the Good mm. Samaritan. Where does he drop the man from the side of the road off at? At the pandion, not at the Cataluma, right? Mm. So what does Cataluma mean? Well, lo and behold, when Luke uses it, he really only uses it in two places. In the story of the Last Supper, where mm. the disciples had to go and prepare a Cataluma for them to meet in. What is that? That's a guest room. It's a guest room. So what we're talking about is Mary and Joseph come to the ancestral home in Bethlehem, and there are already many people there because they all had to come and register for the census. So what's going to happen? Suddenly Mary is quickened, the waters break. Where in the world are they going to put her? Especially since there are concerns about clean and unclean when the birth happens, right? Mm -hmm. So behind the house, there would have been a room usually attached to the house, if you look at the archaeology of the period, where they kept the beast of burden. So somebody didn't put the five-finger discount on the beast and carried it off. Mm. They kept it in the back of the house. What else would have been there? A feeding trough. So mm. Jesus is not born in a barn. That idea comes from St. Francis. Jesus was not born, as far as we know, with animals all around him. They made sure that was not the case because that would have made it difficult. No, it's just Mary and Joseph and the baby Jesus, and then, according to Luke, the shepherds. So the story is not fodder for a sermon about, well, the world rejected the holy couple and Jesus when they came to the inn, and there was no room for them in the world. This is not the message of Luke 2.7. <laughs> they went to a family home, and they had to be put in the back of the house because there were already too many guests in the house. Mm. And the confirmation of this comes from the Matthean account where we are told that when the Magi got there, they were at home. That's right. They're not in the Holiday Inn Express. They're at home in Joseph's relative's home. That's where they are, and that's where the Magi met them. And then, of course, all those stories were crammed together into the nativity scene. You know, the Magi were not there with the shepherds. The shepherds were not there with the Magi. Uh, and, and we don't even know that there were three Magi. We just know it was Magi, plural, who right. gave three. Exactly. Two people can give three gifts. Ten people can give three gifts. So my concern about this passage, especially at Christmas time, is could we please get rid of the urban legends about the Christmas story? Because the plain unvarnished story is powerful all by itself, and it doesn't need any help. It doesn't need any help. That's that's a fantastic reading. There is there was no place for them in the Catalumati. And you say that means guest house. Guest room. Yeah. Guest, guest room. It's guest room, guest house, and out behind. But there would have been a beast of burden, right? Probably. Probably every family had to have, you know, at least an ox to plow the ground if they had ground. Right. Or cow to milk. They or a goat to milk. Mm -hmm. So Jesus was born in a rustic setting at the back of the house. And the other thing is, what we know about Bethlehem is many of these homes backed into a cave. So Jerome may be right that Jesus was born in a cave. And mm -hmm. and that tradition about underneath the Church of the Nativity, there's a cave where people had been, may be true. It may be true. But what's not true is that they were rejected by the world, by the innkeeper, mean old innkeeper, so far as we know, there weren't any inns in Bethlehem anyway. Yeah. Well, that is a great reading and a great corrective, I think, for it. Now, I'm not trying to think about what am I going to do with my crash this Christmas, you know, because it has the cattle and it has the donkey and it has the sheep and it has the camel and it has everybody crowded together under one roof. I don't know. How, how do you undo that, Ben? Well, I don't know that you do. What, what I think you do is you share with them what the original story was like, and then you go and sing, the cattle are lowing, the baby awake. You know, you still <laughs> sing songs. You still have your crash. But what you're doing, actually, is picturing the Christmas celebration like St. Francis wanted. 
because St. Francis loved animals. You know, all creatures great and small. This is St. Francis, right? <laughs> He's the one who put the animals together with the Magi, who, by the way, were not kings. They were astrologers. They were stargazers. Now, they could serve kings, but they weren't kings. So enough with this, we three kings, oh, you know, right. enough with all that. <laughs> we should care about what the story originally says because it doesn't need any enhancement to be a powerful story about the incarnation of the Son of God who came to save us. It doesn't need any embellishment. It, the plain, unvarnished story is powerful enough like it is. Stands on its own. Dr. Ben Witherington, thanks for being with us today on Exegetically Speaking. All right. We got it done. If you learn too much today and your head is hurting, there is one sure cure. That is to share this podcast with a friend. If you've never visited Wheaton College, I hope you'll make plans to do so. We have a wonderful campus all year round. And if biblical languages are your fancy, check out the MA and the BA program at Wheaton College. You can go to wheaton.edu, look for modern and classical languages, get started today. This is the day you want to do it, right? If you have questions or comments, if you just want to be in touch, please email us at exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. That's exegetically.speaking at wheaton.edu. Thanks to all those who make this podcast possible. You know who you are. Until next time, thanks for listening.